203. This is on big data, promoting development and safeguarding privacy. We have a great set of uh, panelists here that I will introduce in a moment. The uh, workshop has been prepared in cooperation between the Council of Europe and uh, the OECD. Uh, I stepped in for uh, Sophie Kwasny, who uh, participated in the preparation and uh, who should have been your moderator. So if everything goes well, the merit is for the OECD colleagues and for uh, Sophie Kwasny. If everything goes uh, foul, you can put it on me. Uh, there was a, a background paper, an excellent paper, uh, Better Policies for Better Lives and that was prepared by the OECD and, uh, and published online uh, for you. I will not go into it, but it's certainly uh, recommended, uh, recommended reading. Uh, we have uh, some panelists uh, up here and we have two remote uh, panelists as well that I hope we will be able to introduce and uh, uh, hear and see probably at a distance. So let me go directly to introducing the panelists. I will say who they are and uh, uh, where they come from very, very briefly if they want to add something in respect of themselves or their organizations. They will be able to do it later on. Uh, <coughs> I, I give them in, in this order. There's no particular order to this. We have Alexandrine uh, Pirlo de Corbion, who uh, comes from privacy, is with Privacy International. Uh, she is uh, uh, dealing with research and promoting privacy issues in uh, a range of countries and continents in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and so on. Uh, we have Yochai uh, uh, Benavi. Uh, from ACCESS, an organization that promotes uh, access to the Internet and human rights online, especially in situations where there are particular difficulties in respect of that. Uh, he is policy director at ACCESS. We have uh, Bill Woodcock, who is from Packet Clearinghouse. I think we will need to hear a bit more about that. But uh, um, uh, Bill knows about the pipelines and how they work and what does that mean and how data is transferred and can be monitored and, uh, and collected and so on. So I think that uh, uh, he will be a particularly uh, good uh, asset for us in this, in this workshop. We also have Marie Georges. She is uh, a Council of Europe expert. Uh, she is uh, very knowledgeable of uh, both national and international legal frameworks in respect of privacy and data protection, and including, uh, including online. She has a very uh, rich hands-on experience because she previously was with the Data Protection Authority in France. And then we have two uh, uh, remote participants. Um, we have Robert Kirkpatrick uh, from UN Global Pulse, which is a, a, a laboratory, an experiment set up by the UN Secretary General in order to explore uh, use of big data uh, for development and for positive use in a UN development context. And we have Christian Reinbach from the OECD, who is one of the co-organizers uh, of, this, of this workshop. We also have in the room uh, Verena Weber uh, from the OECD, and she will be a contributor if, uh, if necessary later on. Um, now, when, when I was uh, thinking about the, how to introduce this, this, uh, this workshop, I, I was not sure. Uh, what, to, what to say. We have different elements here. Uh, I remember that uh, Commissioner Cruz 
Commissioner for Digital Agenda in the, in the European Union some time back said that our governments in Europe in the then 27, now 28, are sitting on a data gold mine worth tens of billions of euros. We have some idea of what that means, but we are not too sure. If we see privacy online in the traditional sense, in the, from the user perspective, very often what we see is the, the, the situation of a little box that has to be clicked. And the best you can see when looking at it is, well, if you decide to use this service and click here, uh, you are authorizing us to use your data for commercial uh, or marketing purposes, and we may share this data with our commercial partners. And you, as the youth uh, uh, participants in the Eurodig in Stockholm a couple of years ago said, described it, they said, well, you click yes and hope for the best. So that is one uh, approach. But I thought that is not what you are going to be discussing. And I thought, how can we turn this around and, and, and see what does it really mean? What does it really mean in the future in, in terms of, of, uh, of importance, of risk, of, of advantages as well, and so on? And I came across very recently uh, some information about climate change. The way we see very often climate change is uh, described as Kyoto and things like that and take up and uh, uh, whether or not there is a trade-off between climate and, uh, and, uh, and the economy and uh, the risks to development if we don't or if we do and so on. But I came across a different presentation of that and I thought, well, what would the user say if we present things differently? What I saw is the question of climate change is killing 300,000 people every year. By the year 2030, apparently, research says, that there will be no more ice on the Arctic Circle. That's a different way of seeing it. I saw a tweet a couple of days ago that said, that by 2054, two and a half billion people will die as a result of climate change. I thought, well, can we turn that around? Can we say something about big data to introduce the, the, the session in, uh, in those terms, to, to really tell the user, tell people out there, what does it really mean for them? two and a half billion deaths by 2054. Can we say that kind of thing in respect of big data? And I thought, well, maybe some of the information that we have been confronted with in, in, in recent times in respect of big data suggests that if you use this service for free, uh, we will use your data collated with other data sets out there, and uh, we will be able to shape your consumption user. Maybe in the midterm, we will be able to uh, shape your health choices. Maybe later on, we will be able to shape your and your community's political decisions. Is that a different way of uh, of presenting it? Is it a realistic way of presenting it? On a tweet, it could uh, uh, sound like, uh, like this. Click I agree and your life will be in our algorithms. Now, I think it's time to, to move to our, to our panelists. Of course, what I said is a, is a big exaggeration but I would first of all ask uh, Marie-Georges, uh, you are concerned by big data. Could you tell us why? Could you tell us just in a few sentences, what is it for you? 
Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, big data. What is it in the reality? Uh, enterprises, government collects data. You know that. Huh? You give them the data, you have some obligations and so forth. Now we have been in this situation for a long time. So it means that you have in the hand of others many data about you. Many, many, many. And uh, some people, scientists and everything, would like to use them and to, to say, well, we can make uh, some knowledge from that. Huh? Uh, making data speaking themselves, huh? data mining and so forth. And so some, uh, I am surprised because here, uh, since yesterday, I, I heard tw twice uh, an IT enterprise saying we should not uh, look so much at the collection of data, but maybe, but more uh, to, on the use of data. What could be the use, huh? the, could, the uh, innovative use of big data? Well, we will see. Uh, I think there are three areas in which we have to think about this relation of, between personal data collected and uh, maybe by different ways. Huh? You, you are in connection with your bank by uh, telephone, by email, by paper you sign for contracts sometimes and, yeah, and so forth. All this going on for years. So we have to look at big data in, in my view in three things. About purpose. I go back to the uh, very classical, I'm sorry, but uh, it, it, uh, sometimes classical things are very useful. Uh, big data, t for which purpose? So, uh, you, make, you can make calculations on, uh, on big data about what? About how the enterprise run is running. It concerns employees, huh? Uh, if you can do better things with that and, and to maximize what? What are you going to maximize through those calculus? Uh, it can be in relation with the client, with the patient, it had been said, and I will further on give uh, examples, and also about research on the society. Uh, and I think we will have to discuss these different things because uh, the implications are different. And we will see further on if there are solutions. How to, what kind of referential we can have in our head to look at precise big data operation. Is that okay? That's a, a very good beginning, thank you. Can I move to Bill and ask him whether uh, the, the location of data, the transit of data, the, 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 the processes of data out there in the open, they have a bearing on all this and on, on the issues that we are discussing. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think we're seeing a lot just uh, over the course of the last few months about uh, you know the NSA wiretapping and so forth, but that's of course just the tip of the iceberg and I think the fact that no European countries are uh, leaping forward to speak out against that uh, indicates perhaps that the NSA is not the only organization uh, doing this or the U.S. the only country doing this. Um, so I think, I think ultimately what we need to be looking at is default operations, what it is that gets done by default with the the actions that users take, whether those actions are processed and dealt with and uh, the user's request is fulfilled and that's the end of it, or whether by default everything is recorded and logged. People responsible for making things work will almost always, if they have the option, log everything by default so that when things don't work, they can figure out why and fix it. And that seems like a, a perfectly reasonable approach to things. Uh, it makes things work better. It makes things ultimately more reliable. It gives the user a better experience. And there's a, a very compelling set of reasons for taking that default. The problem is that disk is really cheap and attention is really expensive. And so once you're recording everything, um, the easiest thing to do when you run out of disk space is just buy another bigger disk. 
and that means that all of that old data is still there. You could alternatively take a bunch of time and attention and try to anonymize the old data, scrub it, so that you still had something useful there if you needed to go back and debug a problem, but it wouldn't expose anything about a person. But the problem with that is we've seen in study after study that anonymization is effectively impossible. The, the basic problem with big data is that you correlate one source of data with another source of data with another source of data, and pretty soon you can create a very three-dimensional picture of a person or an activity or a place uh, without there ever having been any one omniscient point of view. Um, so having these old troves of accidental data sitting around uh, is is a a frighteningly appealing target. Um, you know, it, data also can be copied at no cost, right? It, taking data that one person has and replicating it makes a, a copy of the data and doesn't take it away from the first person. Therefore, stealing data that somebody has is not necessarily an obvious thing to the person from whom it's stolen. Uh, it doesn't necessarily disadvantage them. If they're not disadvantaged, then they aren't necessarily going to admit that it happened or try to get it prosecuted or try to even necessarily make it difficult. Therefore, if these troves of, of user data are sitting around, people can steal them and correlate them with other sources of data, and nobody who collected the data even is necessarily going to be aware that that happened or have any reason to try and uh, make that difficult. So. I think that the technological side of this has to do with, uh, ship, first of all, defaulting to collecting data that doesn't need to be collected. Secondly, uh, storing it when it doesn't need to be kept. And thirdly, shipping it around to somewhere that may happen to be convenient but passes a lot of eyes in the process. Well, that gives some... Uh uh, rise, uh, rises uh, some concern and we seem to be seeing only the tip of the, of the iceberg so, so I, I think that policymakers that thinking ahead should try to see under the surface as well thank you very much for that I would uh, suggest that we move if our remote uh, uh, participation is, is working that we move to, to Robert Kirkpatrick uh, to tell us a bit also about the, the positive side, if the remote participation is, is working, if he could connect. Is that possible? Robert, can you hear us? Can you speak to us? Robert? Hello? Do we have a connection? We don't seem to, to have a connection. I, I would have wanted Robert to tell us about the positive views, the, 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 the possibilities that big data offers for development. Hello? I am here. Testing, yes. testing, testing, testing. One, two, three, four. Can you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Please go ahead. Uh, very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, so I just want to give you a very quick snapshot of Global Pulse and our view on big data um, uh, within the Secretary General's office. Uh, Global Pulse is an initiative that was created out of a global financial crisis back in 2009. Um, and as noted by our moderator, uh, this is essentially a lab for the UN system to learn how to take advantage of all of this data um, that's out there for uh, development and humanitarian action. Um, we're based in New York in our headquarters. We launched Pulse Lab Jakarta in Indonesia last year in October, and we're in the final stages preparing to launch our second Pulse Lab in partnership with the government of uh, Uganda and Kampala. Essentially, 
we find ourselves today living in a hyper-connected world where our need for speed has never been greater because the pace of change is accelerating around us. The irony is that increasingly we're, we're noting that we're... We seem to have lost you. Can we get him back? Is it possible? Hmm? He disconnected. Can we come back to you uh, a little later, perhaps? Can we connect with our other remote participant, with, uh, with Christian? Uh, he was going to, I hoped that he would tell us about the, also the, the, the positive use, the, the, the value of uh, big data for society, but also for the economy and for development. Can we have either of them? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so um, my name is Christian Reinsdorf and I work for the OECD, um, on, in particular on the project called uh, New Sources of Growth, Knowledge-Based Capital. Uh, which looks at uh, data as a source for growth and as a source for innovation. And it's a project that is um, um, involving um, different parts of the OECD, including um, our colleagues working on health, um, including our colleagues working on uh, science and research, as well as our colleagues working on public governance. And the idea is to look at how data and the use of digital data and big data and can promote innovation in those different fields, um, in the area of health, um, in the area of public governance, and um, in the area of science and research. So we see, uh, we are looking at um, this new potential, and, but at the same time, we are also looking at the risk that comes with that. And obviously, privacy is an important one, um, issues related to consumer protection as well. Uh, and we are also looking at uh, issues related to uh, skills and employment, because we believe that there is um, some challenges related to the uh, use of um, big data uh, related to skills. Um, not only do we need people that have the skills to treat and analyze big data, but we also um, have, have to think about what the implication of big data can be on, on employment of the wider economy. And um, later in my intervention, I would like to make a point to focus on open data because if this is an area where we believe um, there is a lot of potential, in particular in the context of development. Um, here we are talking about open data not only from the public sector, so open government data, but we're also talking about um, aspects of uh, public sector and uh, private sector data. So how can we use um, big data from the private sector to promote um, development? Um, maybe um, I would like to stop here um, and um, focus on this uh, during the, the discussion later on. Excellent. Thank you very much. And do stay with us uh, so that we can come back to these uh, uh, matters. Do we have the possibility to get back to Robert so that uh, he can complete his, uh, his uh, initial uh, statement? I am dialed in. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome back. Very good. I'll do my best not to disappear again. Uh, so uh, at any rate, what I was saying is that um, while everyone around us seems to be, you know, struggling to make policy decisions with statistics that are many years out of date, um, and the, the high-level panel for post-2015 has called for a data revolution, um, in a sense, the revolution has already happened, right? There's all of this data out there. Um, you know, people are producing it by going about their daily lives, search, transaction, communication, money transfers, borrowing and repayments. All of these happen over mobile phones via SMS in developing countries. So we see a tremendous opportunity to adapt to these innovations to the fight against hunger, poverty, and disease, to produce a new evidence base for impact, um, new approaches to governance, ways to empower community, and hopefully increase the effectiveness and efficiency of development. Um, you know, the, our hypothesis is, is pretty straightforward. 
people are using digital services all around the world to meet their basic needs at the household level. And when their needs change, they change how they use these services in ways that we can learn through analysis to recognize um, what patterns are left in data when people lose their jobs, when they get sick, when they begin to struggle for, uh, you know, food and medicine and to meet basic necessities. Um, you know, the, the classic example where a lot of this started back in 2007 um, was with Google search. Um, I don't know how many in the audience have ever used Dr. Google. <laughs> um, it's the first thing people do when they or a family member gets sick is they search for information online about their symptoms. Um, this has been shown to predict the outbreaks of diseases like dengue with great reliability. Um, Twitter, we're, be we're working out of Jakarta. Uh, you know, Jakarta produces more tweets per day than any city on earth. And when you filter out the celebrity and sports chatter, what you find underneath is a lot of content where people are talking about the unaffordability of food or fuel, um, job loss, symptoms of diseases. Um, and finally, I would point to data from mobile phones. Um, you know, mobile carriers can see the population of a country moving around in real time on the map. Now, all across the UN, we have maps of poverty, we have maps of disease outbreaks, crop yields, but we can't see the people. But a mobile carrier, as people move, carry their devices around and communicate, can see where people are moving. And this turns out to be very valuable because you can see, for example, um, the, the daily commute to work and when it stops. You can see patterns of migration, where people move after disasters, um, find ways to optimize your transport network um, because you know where the traffic jams are or model the spread of malaria. There's a lot of potential here, but, you know, we think big data is the greatest opportunity um, to present itself to global development in many, many years, unless you fail to protect privacy in the process, in which case this may be the greatest threat to human rights the world has ever known. And I fully agree with Bill. Anonymization is really, really, really hard, and the research is, is constantly suggesting that it may be more than really hard. It may ultimately be impossible. Um, you know, we see an opportunity here to develop a framework for using this information for good in a way that protects privacy um, and in a way that we hope could contribute to a change in the, the public conversation around big data because today it's incredibly polarized. On, on one end, you have regulators concerned about uh, that the, the reuse could represent potential misuse. Um, and on the other end, you have companies pushing the envelope to do everything that they can with this data. We see big data as a raw public good. But we need to learn, you know, in, by building and by testing and by experimenting, how to address a specific challenge while protecting privacy. Um, another piece I'll mention is that a lot of this data is locked up behind the firewalls of corporations, not the stuff that's online, like Twitter and a lot of social media and online news, but um, communication patterns, interactions, transactions. This kind of information companies are using to compete. And so we've been engaging with them in an idea we call data philanthropy, um, helping them work with us to understand what data they could share in a way that protects both privacy and their own business interests, yet still could give us those digital smoke signals, those real-time indicators that something's happening in a part of the world we need to, uh, we need to understand better. Um, so just to, just to summarize, we function as a service to the UN system and member states, um, and we do joint R&D projects leveraging partnerships with private sector and academia who have the data, the technology, and the expertise um, in analysis and privacy. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, and do stay with us because uh, I hope that the discussion will evolve further. Uh, but the, the message was, was clear. There is a lot of good out there in big data, but uh, it will uh, work or not depending on whether we, we master it and whether we uh, manage to protect uh, privacy. Now, I would like to, to turn to, to uh, Jochai and, uh, and to Alex now uh, to tell us more about the, the, the uh, maybe the, the risk areas that we may be confronted with 
and whether they are satisfied with what they are hearing. There's a lot of good that can be done, but perhaps Yochai first? Sure, happy to. Uh, my name is Yochai Benavi. I'm the policy director at Access, access.org. We're an international NGO that defends and extends the right, digital rights of users at risk around the world. Um, so we've, we've heard, you know, there's a growing dependence on technology to connect us to conduct business, for development, for government services. It's exponentially increasing the amount of data that's being collected about us. And as you know, Bill noted, as you know, the cost of storing and mining user data is falling precipitously. Um, companies can use big data and, and governments, too, to predict flu and disease trends, improve education, track political you know, movements, all the, all the good things you know, that um, Rob and his team and other folks are working on. Um, Big data can also get really um, sort of scary and very deep violations of user privacy very quickly. Um, earlier, Jan talked about you know this notion of sort of personalization. You know that big data is also great to give you more you know web experience that's closer to what you really want and gets you the content, and the stuff, and the things that you like. Let me tell you a story. There was there was a girl. Um, she was in high school, um, and she had been you know. Probably given consent to be perhaps to be using Target's website. Target's a big box store in the United States, and you know she's sort of looking at different things, browsing products, and you know Target then analyzes those data um, that were you know pulled together from her traffic, and starts sending her coupons, you know to her family's house, and her dad walks into the school with one of these coupons, outraged. He says, "What the hell is this?" It's a you know, coupon for diapers addressed to his daughter for baby formula. And Target had been able to figure out that his daughter was pregnant before she had even said anything to him. And this is a high school student. And this is a real story. Um, you know, many advertising companies sort of boast that this sort of big data, apart from generating profits, you know, creates this consumer experience for us. But I think we also have to remember that on the other side of that, there's, you, know, you have the sort of creepy violations of privacy, but you also have discrimination. Right, um, that that these companies learn a lot about us, and with all this information, are capable of making very important decisions on our behalf, like determining our credit rating or insurance rates, or even eligibility for a particular job. Um, let me let me tell you another story. So let's say you you use like a music sharing service like Spotify or Groove Shark, um, and they might logically assume that that information will be used to recommend music to you, right? You know, that's, that's what you're doing. You're okay with those algorithms. But that same information could be used to guess at your racial background, to your class, could be used for another purpose to sort of deny you a loan or so. And, and sometimes the companies are wrong too. And, and even if they are right, is it any more acceptable? And where do we draw that line between personalization and discrimination? Um, I know that we're running for a short time here. The other point I want to make though is that corporate collected data is also the fuel of the surveillance machine, right? As the summer's revelations have made us all too aware, instead of conducting sort of targeted surveillance, you know, in sort of along the lines of, of criminal law enforcement generally, that looks at you know due process principles like necessity, proportionality, legitimate aim, and so forth, governments are simply collecting the haystack, right? And so to protect user privacy in the age of, of big data, we need to be looking at you know the corporate the data that's collected by corporations. As Bill, you know, is sort of saying, you know a lot of stuff probably should just not be collected um, or that we need to have very strict you know, limits on for what purposes it can be shared and so forth. Um, the European Parliament's Libe Committee voted on the data protection regulation uh, in Europe yesterday. Um, the DPR has a lot to like in it. It provides you know, provisions for explicit consent, um, for privacy by design and by default, the ability of data protection authorities to levy you know, pretty significant fines. Um, but the law contains two gaping holes as well. Um, companies may engage in profiling as long as that data is pseudonymous, uh, which, you know, as others on the panel have said, is an increasingly meaningless term today. Um, and two, that the DPR allows companies to process your data without your consent if it is within their legitimate interest, which is a super vaguely defined legal term that gives permission to data controllers to share your information with third parties. Um, and so whether it's discrimination based on our web activity um, and habits or sort of governments tracking our every move and, uh, you know, looking at everyone we've ever known, these violations of human rights uh, you know, from big data comes down to sort of data collected by companies. And so we need strong safeguards, and we need them now. Thank you very much. That's a clear and compelling message as well. Can we turn to Alexandrine then and see what her take is on, on this, and uh, especially perhaps if there are particular 
uh, groups uh, in society that would be vulnerable to the use or misuse of uh, data or big data in their respect. Uh, thank you for, for inviting us um, on this panel. Uh, just a quick word about Privacy International for those uh, who don't know us. Um, so we're the first organization to campaign at the international level specifically on privacy issues. Um, and we work on an array of thematic issues uh, and with different uh, professionals to investigate and advocate um, for strong national, regional and international uh, safeguards of the right to privacy uh, and personal data. Um, I mean, the, what's been said so far in terms of, of the positive side of big data, we, we don't contest it. It can have a, a positive impact, and it has been uh, shown, especially in, in the developing world, uh, in terms of um, accessing um, education, healthcare, but also um, delivery of aid, uh, particularly in post-conflict or in conflict situations. Um, so that's been you know, an amazing progress. Uh, but I share the same concerns that were raised with access and specifically um, in terms of, you know, the context in developing countries. Um, we, have to, we have to look beyond, uh, you know, the economic and the social development. There's also the human security element. And with the use of big data, we're, we're losing that, that part uh, of development because we're challenging, we're putting at risk the human rights of individuals that we're supposed to be helping. Um, so that's something that we feel that is not taken into account when developing uh, yeah, development programs. Um, it is is the really the impact on, on privacy, but also linked uh, human rights, like the freedom of expression, of association and movement. Um, so one of the things that's really concerning, and, and it's linked not just to the developing world, but to big data in general, um, is uh, its discriminatory and exclusionary nature um, of big data. Uh, so what I mean by that is the data collected is from people that are active you know, on the Internet, that take part in Facebook, who buy online, um, who maybe have a mobile. So all of these uh, data is brought together, but it excludes the ones that don't take part in these activities, um, whose behavior, decisions, uh, and needs are completely excluded from decision-making uh, processes who use these um, big data uh, programs. Um, and for example, like taking the example of Africa, I mean, in some countries there's less than 10% of the population that's connected and using the internet. Um, so what does that mean about the decisions and the policies that are developed based on the data that's collected online? Um, Another element we wanted to, to bring forward, um, and it's really important, especially in, in, in developing countries um, with sensitive um, political but socioeconomic context as well, is the potential for surveillance. Um, so this big data is generated, uh, and there's a possibility to draw conclusions um, and develop patterns of behaviors and profiles um, and the aggregation of this data means that certain elements of somebody's identity can be revealed even though the individual had not consented to this data being given. Uh, so for example, it's not because you agree to, to share data about that you have a Facebook account, that you are online, and that you have a mobile. Um, from this data, it's possible to, to identify maybe what ethnic group you're from, what religion, uh, what is your sexual orientation. And in certain contexts, the ability to identify these really intimate uh, criteria by an individual and what makes them, um, yeah, their identity um, can have really, in some cases, tragic consequences. Um, so, so these are all elements of concerns that we wanted to raise. There are many more, and I'm sure they'll, they'll come up in the conversation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you've introduced a, a few additional elements of risk. Not only we were talking about privacy and so on, but now we, we have a linkage to freedom of expression, association, even the right to freedom of movement uh, through, through monitoring of, of uh, uh, roaming uh, mobile devices and so on and so forth. We have not only a big brother situation, but uh, a set of big siblings out there that are looking into our data and collecting and processing and, uh, and, uh, and monitoring our, our conduct. Um, 
I would like to, to open the discussion to, to the rest of the participants in the room, but before I do that, I would uh, want to, to turn to, to, to Maria again and see whether she would say, okay, we've heard good and bad. Uh, are your concerns uh, uh, mitigated? Uh, are they uh, increased uh, by what you have been hearing? And do we have any, any solutions? Can we look towards the future with, with, some, uh, with some hope? <clears throat> yes, we have uh, some solutions, but maybe we are needed uh, some more that uh, nobody for the moment uh, has seen. Uh, of course, uh, when we talk, uh, and I hope our friend from the UN is here, uh, I recall that UN adopted in 90, uh, uni uh, unanimously uh, at the General Assembly, uh, guidelines on data protection. And I will show how it can be used. OCDE has also guidelines. So, before saying that we have nothing, we should look at what we have. Uh, I was very interested by what our colleague here said first, default. Is there a need to collect data? I'm sorry, that is uh, personal, what I say here, is that we don't have the technology that we need socially. Uh, you cannot do anything with Internet uh, or with your telephone without leaving traces. This is not normal. In the real life, uh, when you meet people, uh, after a while you ask, who are you? After a while, maybe, what is your telephone number? Before asking even, uh, where do you live? Huh? You see these kind of things. Which means that in the real life, we need every, every uh, tools for meeting people without being uh, revealing who we are. Uh, we, when you, you search on a search engine information, it's like being in a library. Uh, you could look at anything. Nobody has to know what you are looking for. Well, in the real world for the moment, it is not the case. Uh, and we will go back to that because it is very important in relation to the right of privacy information also. Uh, so, uh, you cannot be anonymous when it is needed and the freedom uh, that we all knew. Uh, we don't, and uh, then we need different kind of identification when it is needed. When you have to pay, why do you have to say who you are and your card number? We don't have uh, universal coins on Internet. In the life, you can pay anonymously. Huh? You don't need to say who you are. You pay. That's all. Okay, you understood. So I don't know when the IT community will help us in that sense, but we, will, we should need all these different uh, device services and the way. Uh, David Schaum, I, I didn't hear from him for a long time, American living in Netherlands. About 10, 15 years ago, he told me, we should send our request to everyone so nobody knows to whom I am talking to because everyone gets it. But only one will get it because it will be uh, encrypted and so the other one who, that you are looking for will know who you are. That's a way to be anonymous and well, it is not enough. But this is impossible for the moment. Huh? We don't have the wires and everything for that. Okay, so we need this kind of thing. Uh, but, so, after that, big data, default. I completely agree. Huh? Uh, on Google, we, could, we should be able to look for something without leaving any trace, huh? the record. We should say no data are uh, collected. Now, uh, big data uh, regarding... Um, Individual decision. Big data means data mining, profiling. You will look at the Convention 108 uh, modernized, the, the directive in Europe uh, 95, and the French law on 78 already. Profiling. 
Uh, there is a recommendation from the Council of Europe uh, from uh, 2010 on profiling. Very interesting. So, when people are looking to take decisions about you on a profiling, of course it has to be forbidden injustice decision. No, only the French law has that. No one international uh, uh, privacy uh, business says that it is forbidden to use profiling techniques to decide uh, the, the amount of penalty or the amount of... Uh, it is not said anywhere. It should be. Okay. Under the profiling. The problem is that no one of us is a prof according to a profile. And what did they take in the profile they found in their big data? Only what they had in. Maybe you are something else with some uh, other information that you could give and which could lead to another decision. So, in profiling, you need to know on what basis is taken the, the, the first decision. Now there is a safeguard huh, in Europe. Huh? Uh, you can always contest. Huh? You can contest the decision, but you have to, to move. Huh? <laughs> okay. And uh, secondly, in some countries, any profile, technique of profile, is submitted to the authorization of the DPA. And I can give you examples where it, there was no, no authorization. In a bank score, uh, scoring, huh? uh, to know how much we are going to give you for a loan. Uh, they found in banks that uh, when there is a huge difference of age between husband and wife, there is problems on the account. The more it is. And the DPA refused to take this in account because you have the right to live with, uh, to marry anyone, and this should not have any consequ economic consequence. You can think of many situations in which, I mean, with this example, if you look at other profiles that are, are done, it will give you the idea of how to think about. Uh, also, you, now with genetics and with huge health uh, data files, you can even predict what a, a, a person may have as a disease. What do you do if you don't know how to treat that disease? Do you tell the person or not? There had been an experience uh, for making, uh, um, hmm, to know what is the, the, the DNA uh, completely. So, uh, samples of a patient had been taken from, uh, a patient, from doctors, and they, they were at the beginning, uh, and they made those, uh, and they saw that some people could have, uh, and they were asking, does the doctor of this patient has to tell him? One DPA decided, no. If you don't know how to treat someone, why should you give it the, the information, if it is not required, of course. But think of, of that. Yes, it's true that we may be in a changing world. Huh? If, if, if we are going to, uh, to deal, each of us, with all the prediction that all the big data is going to give us, we have to be careful. Uh, now Marie, on research. Marie, uh, now, can, can, uh, we, can we move on? Because I would like to, to be able to have the opportunity to interact also with the, with the rest of the participants. You will have the opportunity to come back. I have the impression that we have been assuming a lot. We assume that uh, in the past we benefited from privacy that we don't uh, have anymore. I would advance that privacy never existed that the moment we go out into the street, privacy doesn't exist. We are seen by people. What has changed is the latency of the information in respect of us. How long does it re stay recorded somewhere in someone's brain? 
it has changed in respect of the ability to retain it, to collect it, to aggregate it, and to process it. But in reality, privacy very seldom existed or existed in very marginal and restricted areas, even in respect of payment. The moment you pay cash, it doesn't mean you are anonymous. It means that the transaction is recorded in someone's mind for less time. So privacy in that respect never existed either. It was the, the difficulty to collate and to correlate that information with other data sets, if you want, that has changed. Can I turn to the, to the rest of the participants? What is your take? What are your questions? What are your observations in respect of what we have been discussing? There are a number of uh, requests for the floor. Do we have uh, roaming mics? Please, can you give it to the person closest to you? And perhaps we can take another uh, microphone to the other side so that we can have a quick uh, yeah. switch afterwards. May I use this? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. That's a very interesting discussion, primarily about private sector use of data. But I think that the big elephant in the room at IGF this year may very well be the revelations about the U.S. National Security Agency and the amount of uh, uh, data it has not only collected but allegedly used. Um, so I, I'd like to get the panel's uh, uh, thoughts on that, and just as a disclosure, I'm an American journalist and will be writing this for some American newspapers, so what you say may be on the record, but it's on the record anyway, but thank you. <laughs> and if you'd identify yourself, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. Can we, can we uh, uh, collect more comments first, and then we will have a, a, a tour of, of responses. Someone said uh, from the panel earlier uh, that uh, also the corporate uh, collection of data feeds into the surveillance machinery. So, so we, we have that idea as well, the, the interlinkage between the two. Please go ahead. So, so big data, uh, sorry, John LaPreeze from Northwestern University. So big data is just noise without the statistical tools to analyze it. And I've heard very little discussion from the panel about the availability of such tools, the complexity and sophistication of the tools, which is not evenly distributed, obviously uh, in line with the previous speaker, it's apparent that intelligence agencies have better statistical tools for analyzing big data than perhaps corporations do. What's, could I have the panel's input on sort of the other half of the big data question, which is not just the raw material, but the tools necessary and the skills necessary to use those tools? Thank you. Could we move the microphone to the other side, please. Yes, and if we could bring one forward, there's a number of hands up on this side. If we could make sure that we can switch quickly to them. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, just a response to the assertion that privacy never existed. Um, uh, just, I think that's a big failure to distinguish between the public and private spheres. And privacy is the right to reveal selective information about oneself. So I just want to maybe put a hypothetical to you all. But uh, before the existence of the Internet, when you walked through the street, uh, would you have unwittingly revealed your sexual preferences, your health, um, how you like to have sex behind closed doors? Um, so, yeah, by going out into public, you don't lose the right to selectively reveal information you you about yourself. Thank you. Very good. That's another aspect, the, the right to, to present oneself, to, to show an image of oneself, to construct an image of oneself that is presented publicly. Please, Please go ahead. Uh, Rita, Open Data Hong Kong. Uh, I have a question to Christian Reimsbach of the OECD, but perhaps also to the other panel members. And that is the question on how do we actually um, encourage companies to uh, release data into the, for the greater common good. I'm thinking in particular of, for instance, utility companies for climate change data or um, other uh, data that, is, that has not only corporate value but has actually more value if it is released uh, uh, in the public domain. So how do we encourage the companies? Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, someone else has the microphone? Uh, yes. Valentina from Bosnia. I'm I'm interested about the frame because all those data are collected massively. And, uh, you know, whenever you collect something, there is an hypothesis, an assumption. And I'm wondering who is framing the hypothesis and assumption. And I think that we still, with big data, we have the risk also to mainstream a very uh, status quo of the society. We never mainstream uh, 
the diversity, the alternative, because they are also always a minority. They are somewhere there just to continue the ghettos. So for me, it's also important that big data has, has becomes a strength when we can change. So who is framing? An algorithm can be very sexist. And we see when, we, when you Google, and you Google uh, about women, it's not very progressive. It's just giving you the image as the women has to be, which was as always we have been. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's another interesting well. angle. Someone else um, has the microphone yeah. up in front. I'm please. Bastian from the Netherlands, and I heard someone saying it, will, it should be possible to search on Google without giving up your privacy. But the thing is, there work 50,000 people at Google who make possible the things we are using, like Gmail, Google Search, and they need to get paid in order to keep, in order um, for us to keep using that services. When they, when Google has no money, we won't be able to use that services, and they earn money by using our privacy. So we should either give up our privacy or not use Google. It isn't possible to use them both. And that's, I think, a misunderstanding that's, that I heard a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. That's an interesting point. Can we move to this side so that we don't uh, only hear one side of the room? I'm sure there are no sides here, but uh, <laughs> at least in, in terms of uh, location. Uh, there is a lot of interest. Uh, I would like to, to take a, a couple of more uh, comments so that we can do a quick round uh, uh, on, the, on the table and with our remote participants and then go back, revert to you again. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great uh, panel. Um, really, um, lots of very valuable opinions. I would like to provide an extension to the question raised uh, from the lady from, from Hong Kong. Um, the information that is... Um, um, uh, collected by, by companies can be some of it released for the, for the better good, but in some in many countries, the most of the information is collected actually by government agencies and ministries: Ministry of Transportation, Ministry, ministry of Finance, um, Ministry of Health. Um, lots of information is already available to these agencies, and the public does not have any control about what information is released and to whom, and um, and uh, and what what use is it um, uh, uh, used for. So I, I think extending the, the, the paradigm, extending the, um, the, the, the input to um, the, the public sector, to the government, is also very important for the information they collect. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else had uh, the microphone on this side? Please. I think there is a focus on uh, uh, the use of big data between governments and companies, but uh, now also academia is drawn into the subject as well. There has been a lot of programs from academic institutions that try to analyze um, big data that is produced by activists online in different parts of the world where there are crises happening to uh, collect or analyze a narrative on the political situation on that country without really um, uh, applying the rules of research, of a humanitarian re a human a humanity research and uh, uh, using the data of the subjects too. Uh, especially that these tools of analysis and algorithms that are used to analyze the political situations are in, uh, done in closed rooms. So I was wondering what are the panelists' uh, opinions on, on the use of academia, on the practices of academia to analyze uh, different uh, usages or different act, uh, activism online to produce political narratives too. Thank you very much. There's someone who has been raising their hand over there in the middle. Please, could you pass the, uh, to this uh, person? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Lena Taylor from Oxford University. Um, I have a question about anonymization, which I think is the other elephant in the room here, because those of us in research know that, and I think everybody in the big data science sphere knows that anonymization is not actually fully possible in the age of big data, and that another data set will always come along which can be linked or merged in the future. And so rules for ethical research, which the previous commentator was, was mentioning, now include the requirement that you predict the existence of future data sets and technologies which might de-anonymize your research participants. This is not possible. So what, is the, what are the panel's thoughts on that? 
Thank you very much. We have a number of issues that uh, have been raised. I won't give the floor anymore to the, to the participants on that side. I would like some reactions here. We have had remarks in respect of uh, security agencies, of uneven distribution uh, of the tools and the, and the capabilities between different entities, the question of uh, private, uh, privately held data passing to public hands for the public uh, good as well, uh, assumptions in respect of society that can model uh, future uh, and perhaps the need to, to move away from those assumptions and allow society to evolve in its own, in its own way. Uh, the way we pay for services which appear to be free and, uh, and which in terms of, of, uh, of staff and, uh, and resources are very costly out there. Do we have different ways of doing that? There is uh, the question of supervision. Uh, it came through in different ways. Um, uh, there is the question of uh, political development and activism and crisis management, uh, uh, which can be assisted by, by big data. And the, the, the question, again, related to supervision, the question of ethical values, how do we uh, introduce an ethical dimension into the use of big data, and is it enough to have ethical values out there that are agreed to, or is it necessary to be able to influence, to, 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 to monitor, to supervise the way it is, it is handled? I, I turn to the, to the panel. I, I will also ask uh, the remote participants to, to intervene, uh, and, uh, and uh, I would like them to, to pick what question they would like to answer very quickly, uh, perhaps in Twitter form, in tweet form, uh, um, uh, to, to your various remarks. Uh, we can take it along the, the, the table. Yeah, I'll res respond to, to the f a few of the issues raised. Um, re the first one regarding the Snowden revelations. Um, it's true that these revelations have cast light on how much data I I is being collected and without a purpose, which, as Marie-Georges mentioned, it was, you know, it's the basics. Uh, of, of the regulations, like what is the data that you're going to collect, um, do, what is the, your objective, and you need to justify that to, to the data owner uh, when you collect their data. And the way that big data is being developed, there is no way at every step of the process uh, to get consent. Um, and also what, what's been revealed uh, about uh, with the Snowden is really the idea that this data will be there in case it can be used one day. Um, and, and that's really dangerous in, in protecting the right to privacy of individuals um, because it's not using it in a specific point in time to develop a policy or um, you know, for law enforcement. is in case one day something happens that you might have to resort to using that information. Uh, and that's again linked to, to the issues um, of consent. Um, I'm a bit worried uh, about the question about how to encourage companies to reveal their data uh, because the point is for data, private companies to have um, privacy policies to protect their customers. Uh, so I wouldn't advocate uh, for companies to just reveal all the information they have about their customers. This has to be done in a, you know, a manner in which the data owners understand what their data is going to be used um, and you shouldn't just be putting all the information out there to be used even if it's for a social and you know development purposes um, because at the end of the day you're, you're violating the privacy of these individuals even if the end goal is positive um, so I think that's something really to, to take in, into account as well in the short term uh, but, but also in the long term um, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll stick to that for now and then pass on. Thank you very much. Marie? Uh, on the Snowden business, uh, in my view, if it continues, if uh, Prism and, and all others does not stop after a while, uh, people will be uh, very afraid to use any kind of IT. In the 70s, uh, when the first laws came up on data protection, uh, IBM, made a, IBM was the Google of today huh, at that time. Um, 
made an international study and saw that if they did not support laws for data protection, there will be a, a reject of uh, IT. Uh, today, in my view, it, we are the limit. And uh, I hope the uh, U.S. will uh, give good news after all what happened, uh, because it is not possible. It is against the international law. Huh? You cannot spire another state. It's a question of sovereignty. And here it was not for uh, terrorism. It was for economic spying. Uh, I could uh, talk about that a long time. Political and uh, economic spying. So this is uh, completely against, uh, and even with allies, which is terrible. So we are in a war, in an economic war. In that context, uh, what about big data and our uh, safeguards? First, as I said, the more you have data, the, the less it is possible to anonymize. Everybody says so. Still in Europe, we think that it, it is possible. I saw yesterday the compromise. They talk about anonymization as it was, a, no. Uh, a safeguard uh, for another purpose than the one for which you gave your data huh? if it's for research uh, and all what we said it's another purpose you have to give your consent clear and not one consent for many things one consent huh? you may not like your data go to, to a psychiatrist research uh, that is your uh, grandfather or your uh, uncle. Huh? So you, this is, should be possible. Secondly, when we are talking about research, uh, about uh, pr private or public data, uh, today, and in, uh, as I said, huh, the more you have data on a, an individual, the more they are sensitive. For the moment, we still have categories of sensitive data. Tomorrow, in my view, all the, 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 the records you have in a, will be all, uh, has to be treated as sensitive data. Which means, when in the area of, of sensitive data like health, what do you have? You have, in many countries, and I think maybe all now, uh, an independent body which looks at which research the people want to do, is it in conformity with public interest or not? I'm very afraid of uh, private studies uh, not published, sold by big enterprises which have millions of individuals' data huh, that will, could make any kind of data, or any kind of research, even against the public interest. This is not possible. And for money. That could really happen. So we have to invent in, in this area uh, some kind of procedure to be sure that the studies which are made uh, are on the public interest. Uh, uh, maybe everybody doesn't know how to do that here. You look at what is done in, in health sector, for instance. I mean, we have to, to see what exists already. And we could, we could see that. Thank you very much. If we can move on so that we can come back to the floor again. Uh, Bill, please. I'm going to try and speak very quickly because I'm going to try to address three different of the points here. Uh, first, one of the things that you said, Marie, uh, the need for tools to allow stage disclosure and anonymity. I couldn't agree more. Um, we have very few tools in this area. They're... Um, uh, there is not enough competition between tools to uh, ensure that we have good development and, and progress in this area. The problem is that because there are so many people who value people's pr private data, who feel that they can put it together with other things <laughs> in order to turn a profit, there's an economic incentive for the data to be collected. And that's what powers companies like Google, right? That's um, what gives them the money to hire the programmers to uh, do the development work, whereas the tools for not collecting the data, the tools for preserving privacy, there's no economic incentive to anyone to not collect data, right? This is a, a default position which should exist, but for which there isn't a financial benefit to 
any individual company, any individual software developer, for instance. Um, so we have this, but we have it as a result of people who are working in the public good, who are um, giving up their time and their energy uh, in order to make the world a better place. And so this is something that is perfectly feasible in economic good times, uh, when we have an, a potlatch economy, an economy of plenty, and people can do good works and know that they will be taken care of and they'll have food on the table tonight, despite the fact that they spend all day working for society rather than working for a profit. Um, and the problem is, since 2008, we've just had a pretty rotten economy globally. And so um, the open source software development, uh, open standards development, have both uh, suffered during that time. And so I think, um, you know, we had a lot of work that happened uh, during the dot-com boom, right? There was a lot of money flowing into industry, a lot of people uh, happy to take a speculator's money and use it to do good work and then declare bankruptcy or whatever. Uh, you know, a lot of, and then, you know, during the sort of mid-2000s, there was kind of a slack period when, uh, you know, the economy wasn't too bad and a lot of people were kind of sitting around waiting for something to happen and, and got a lot done. But in the last five years, I, I would say very little has, has occurred in, in this area and it really needs to. And I think um, this is an area in which philanthropy could be a lot of, of help and I think it's an area in which governmental spending on uh, supporting uh, open source software development could be a lot of help because the private sector is just not going to do it. it. There isn't a, a profit motive there. Um, the, the second uh, point I was going to try and make is addressing this question about the notion that there's a debt owed to Google. Um, I think uh, the, these kind of tie together, right? If, if you're not the, um, the customer, you're the product. Uh, if you're using Google services, then you are being sold to their actual customers. If you want to be Google's customer, there's no problem. You can go and spend money on Google AdWords. They will happily serve you. If you're using search, it's not a question of you owing them something. It's a question of them selling you to their customers. Right? You don't owe them for the fact that they employ software developers to write profitable tools to do advertising. Right? That's just like saying you owe advertising agencies your time looking at their advertisements in a magazine, right? Yes, it's the advertisements that pay for that magazine, but you don't owe them your time staring at a picture of a bottle of scotch, right? Um, third point uh, on how governments use uh, big data. Uh, just to, to note that uh, I think there was a FOIA request uh, that was just publicized in the New York Times uh, this morning about the uh, Transportation Safety Administration in the United States uh, is now doing using big data to uh, pre-screen travelers before they even get to the airport and they're using uh, in addition to the, the information they were already using uh, car registration information, uh, employment information, uh, tax payment information, property ownership information and past travel itineraries which is a lot of different data sources to correlate. Um, and they were already doing that kind of thing for international travelers arriving in the US. Now they're doing it, you know, if you just want to take a 20 minute flight to the next town. And, you know, they keep trying to expand, you know, to, you know, buses and subways and things like that. Uh, so it's very hard to know where this will stop. And I think it's important to remember that ultimately we're all paying the cost of this, right? It's not. It's not just their time that's being used up in doing these kinds of correlations. Their time is being paid for with tax dollars, and that's true of all governments. So, you know, the question of what governments choose to do, it's not academic. It actually has a cost, and the alternative is better health care, better public transportation, better schools, right? Spying on people comes at the cost of all these other kinds of public services that have some measurable benefit, and I don't think anyone has done any studies yet showing big social benefits to spying. We, we are running out of time. We have uh, still 12 minutes. I would like uh, Jochai to, to, to react, and I would like to give the, the opportunity also to Robert and Christian. 
And then I would hope that we still have some time for the rest of you. All right, I'll try and keep it pithy. Um, Bill took my New York Times article that I was going to cite. So, but I, I think what that highlights, right, is, is again that the data, you know, big data is being used certainly by corporations to maximize profits. Um, but it is also, again, I, and I repeat my, my line from earlier, right, corporate collected data is the fuel of the surveillance machine, right? And so it's whether it's the TSA or the NSA um, or other intelligence agencies, the DEA working with AT&T to collect over 30 years of data in the Hemisphere Project. I mean, at the end of the day, we're dealing primarily with, with the companies collecting the data and then the government getting it from the companies. And so I think that, that that's really at the heart of this. Um, the other thing that's, that we haven't really touched on is a lot of countries – um, disambiguate these two things, right? So in, in the European context, we have the data protection regulation, which mostly deals with the sort of corporate user interaction, and then we have the data protection directive that deals mostly with what law enforcement can do um, with user data. And I, and I think that we really, given the sort of inherent connection between these two things, um, we shouldn't disambiguate them. We need to have comprehensive data protection. And, and further, I would add that a lot of countries don't have a data protection bill at all. Um, and that's really something where we need to be doing more, um, particularly in developing countries. There is a dearth of, of comprehensive data protection bills. Um, and so that's, I think, that we're seeing two major standards in the data protection regulation in Europe and the Convention 108 modernization going on in the Council of Europe um, as sort of models there. Um, just trying to hit on a couple of more points. Um, you know, in terms of the sort of the, the what about the tools to analyze data question, um, I, I think that's exactly where the field is in this sort of dumb data is, is just a haystack, right? But there's all this work on sort of smart data right now to try and build algorithms and tools and so forth um, that are really making this no longer a matter of statistical analysis, but of using a pretty easy to use, you know, guide user interface. Um, and so it's becoming easier and easier to violate people's privacy in that way. Um, moreover, I would just, just raise your hand. Who here has heard of a company called Axiom? Right? So we've got, like, what, five people. So Axiom is, like, a, a huge data broker. And so it's not a matter of having to have, you know, the, the in-house statistical capability um, to make use of it. You can just buy profiles. And Axiom profiles is, like, 100 bucks or something. Um, and so, you know, I think that we need to, again, consider that part of the equation. Um, I wanted to touch on the, on the point of um, mainstreaming. So Eli Pariser wrote this book called The Filter Bubble. Um, maybe some of you have read it. And so he argues that in addition to sort of this sort of wave towards personalization, we're increasingly finding ourselves in echo chambers, right? That we're only getting, you know, if from your Google search history it figures out that, you know, you have a certain, you know, let's say you're, you're, uh, you're Googling when, you know, a conservative radio show is on. You know, you're going to start to get more increasingly conservative results and you're going to be caught in your political bubble. Um, there are things that they can be determined from big data, like if you know a computer can tell that you know if a website can tell that you're using a Mac, Mac users tend to be a little bit more liberal, right? And so then you can that biases the data that you get, and you find yourselves in these sort of filter bubbles, um, and that sort of weakens our political discourse and uh, and stops us from being exposed to sort of minority opinions, and, and that's something of concern. Um, in terms of sort of what is sensitive data, sort of point that Marie George brought up, I mean. We've for, for a long time recognized sort of healthcare data, financial data as, as deserving of a higher protection. We have greater affirmative obligations on companies when they're holding that kind of data. And I would argue that, you know, your Facebook profile probably says a lot of things about you that should also be protected um, and, and are probably things that you care probably maybe even more about than some of your financial details. Um, and so I think that we I agree that we really need to have a much more expansive definition of, of, uh, of what is protected information, what information should be protected, and the sort of obligations that come around that. Um, finally, just to, to pick up on one thing that, um, that Bill said, you know, you were sort of giving a, a, a sort of brief historionics of sort of the, the, <laughs> the economics of, of development and privacy enhancing technologies. And, and I think that here too, this sort of the, the summer's revelations of mass surveillance have the potential to be a game changer. I mean, I think that there has never been a better time for innovation and privacy and for it to sell privacy as a product. Um, and I think that we really need to capitalize that. And I think that, you know, let's say more rights respecting governments, you know, can sort of perhaps help to encourage that. Um, 
and as well as for sort of companies to really be considering entrepreneurs, investors, and so forth. Um, so perhaps I'll end there in the interest of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we see whether we can get through to our uh, remote participants, Robert and Christian, whoever can come in? Is it possible? Yes, Robert? No? Robert? Two, three, four, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, please, go ahead. Okay, um, so I'll be brief. So, as I've mentioned, we've been engaging with a lot of companies around the world that um, collect different kinds of data. And uh, this is our, you know, data philanthropy strategy. And as we've engaged with these companies, you know, we've said, first of all, um, we, we're interested in policy decisions based on analysis of this data, which means that individual identity is not relevant. You're not interested in knowing that someone lost his job and had to sell the family cow. You're interested in knowing that in this particular district of a country, there was a 300% increase in attempts to sell livestock at an odd time of year. Right. So the idea is that we never receive any personally identifiable information. This is one of the, our founding principles for working with big data. We never received data that was presumed to be confidential at the time it was generated. Text messages, emails, people's posts on their Facebook wall, and so forth. Um, and we never seek to re-identify from data. So there, you know, I believe that there are ways that companies can share data um, that significantly reduce um, the risk of misuse of that data, but the point is, you know, we recognize that you cannot never reduce um, the risk to zero, and I'll come back to that momentarily, but as we've approached companies, we've gotten an incredibly positive response. Um, we've never actually been told no. There are companies that are concerned about sharing data publicly because of the competitive risks uh, to their business and the risk to privacy. Um, they're concerned about sharing with government because of concern over increased regulatory scrutiny. But the idea of the UN as a trusted neutral body and as a, as a bridge between public and private sector is an interesting role to consider uh, for the UN in the 21st century. The reasons that companies are interested in this is, is, is fascinating. I mean, we were expecting corporate social responsibility, but and that's certainly there. It's a new way to give. They're recruiting 20-something millennials who understand the power of data and are looking for social impact in increasingly data-driven companies. But there's really a shared value proposition around this. Um, if the data that you collect from your customers, let's say in a developing economy, can be used in a, a safe, privacy-protecting way to get earlier, you know, early warning signs that that population is at risk of falling back into poverty, then that information could be used to actually mitigate business risk by increasing uh, the agility of policy responses. So it's interesting, the, the responses we've seen. Um, companies tell us, you know, some data they could share openly, some they could share only if it's pooled with that of their competition. Um, in other cases, the data could only be shared, um, no, well, not the data itself, but that only analysis of the data could be shared. So, for example, a project we're working on, if it turns out that when the rains don't come in the Sahel, Nomadic populations move away from drought-stricken areas, have less money to spend on airtime, and receive inbound mobile money transfers from relatives in the cities. And if we can see that through analysis of mobile data, we could actually build an open source platform that any mobile company in the world could plug into their network and it could give you real-time hotspots of drought-related stress and trend lines without the data ever being shared outside the firewall. But we have to do that core research first to know what the patterns are. Ultimately, we see a, a kind of data commons in which uh, di you know data from different industries is pooled and shared safely to give us essentially something like socioeconomic weather, real-time information on what's happening in communities around health and agriculture and employment, um, but at an aggregate level. Um, the, the, the future of this is probably we think um, third-party access being actually gated by individuals, that at the end of the day, we need a population around the world that understands consent, um, and a population that also understands that there are trade-offs 
to be made. But calls you can never, uh, you, we don't live in a world where absolute guaranteed anonymization is possible, just to wrap up, um, that, you know, we're always going to be making trade-offs between public good and the possible risk of re-identification. When you go on Amazon and it says people who like this book also like that book, people see the benefit to that, even though they're at, it's actually being produced by aggregating consumer purchases. If a, a social networking company says, based on analysis of your profile, you're 70% likely to break up with your girlfriend next Tuesday, people are horrified because they don't see the public good. And what we want is to uh, move toward uh, long-term a populist and a form of governance that recognizes that um, we have to make responsible and effective trade-offs to minimize risk to privacy but maximize public good. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Robert. Uh, we have to move on. We only have a couple of minutes left, uh, so I will invite uh, the participants who want to continue interacting with the uh, panelists to come up after we finish, after we close. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to invite uh, uh, Christian to, to uh, also respond to the comments that have been made. Can we have Christian online? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I would like to, to focus on, on basically two points because of, of time, of the time. Um, I think the, the first point is um, actually, Sherry, your, your um, intervention or your comment saying that uh, privacy never existed, um, because it will link to another point that I would like to make. Um, I think what is probably true is that we never had something like perfect privacy. Um, that is, obviously, you could, even in the real world, without digital technology, you could never be completely anonymized and um, and this is probably, this is true indeed. Um, but this links to the point that I would like to make that indeed there has never been something as perfect anonymization and there will always be um, the possibility to track back and de-anonymize um, your data set. But um, as there is nothing like perfect privacy, um, uh, we, we shouldn't, I mean, we shouldn't declare privacy to be dead or to be unuseful. Because um, obviously there is a big benefit in having something like privacy, and I think also there is also a benefit in having anonymization and using anonymization, because um, to some extent it works. It creates some barriers for people to re-identify um, um, and link back to um, the data to individuals, and this barrier can, in some state, in some in, um, instances, be very, very crucial and helpful. So um, I think we should continue to promote anonymization and we should also use it. And, and this links to my, uh, my second point, which is um, I think obviously there's the benefit. We all recognize that there is a benefit in big data and, and in particular in the context of development, um, we see that those benefits are really um, important because in, in to, to some respect, you could say that big data can save lives in, in developing countries. And um, so, given the limitations, uh, given the, this potential, we should really work hard in order to, to try to see how can we use anonymization um, in order to make sure that people can share their data and also um, use it to, for this greater good. Um, I would like to go to my next point, with, which is um, the, the issue of sharing data, because I think that it's, um, as Robert mentioned, it, this is an important point. Um, I, I know that companies have um, interest also in sharing their data. Um, it's not only that they have that they see the benefits for larger society, but um, they also see benefits for themselves or for their business. And we talked to some companies, and they agreed that. Um, they would be willing to share the data, anonymize, obviously not everything, everything, obviously not those data that are related to their trade secrets. And we're also not talking about sharing data in terms of highly detailed um, data that um, uh, will let people um, track their customers. But um, to some extent, they could share aggregated data, they could share anonymized data. And they they told us that they would be willing to share the data if they would know that other companies would share the data too. Um, because they also see the value in this kind of shared data because this would allow them also to learn about uh, what is going on, 
uh, based on the data that they um, competitors or other companies are collecting. So I guess the question here is how do we organize this sharing? And, and I think the public sector had an important role to play, not only in terms of regulation, but uh, one of the participants mentioned that uh, ministries are collecting data. And indeed, um, you could think about regimes where um, the public sector would collect the data because of um, internal reasons, but then would uh, share the data in an anonymized um, and um, privacy-friendly way. And maybe um, my last point... I need, yes. to, I need to cut you. We have already exceeded slightly our time. Okay, uh, that's fine. Thank you very much for your, for your comments. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, all of these last round of comments has uh, given me maybe my, my closing line, which is, which is a thought I would like to leave with, with you, with everyone uh, here, which is that if data is not available in respect of a person, uh, that will be considered a risk factor. We have heard comments that suggest that certain profile uh, of a person may give rise to concern. Now, uh, if people start becoming less visible in the big da data scene, that may be considered also as a, as a risk factor. So, so it may be necessary to make uh, the, the trend to anonymity, to uh, less data availability, uh, bigger so that the profiling fails. Because if not, um, if, if there's less data about me, I will be considered a, a risk factor because I am withholding my data. I am not traceable. I am not visible to the eyes uh, out there. Um, with that, uh, I would have many other points. It was not my role to summarize and to, and to collect uh, your, your views and so on, only to animate your discussion. I hope I have done that to your satisfaction. It uh, uh, only remains for me to thank you all. You have been great, you have been patient, and you have been tolerant with, with us, uh, and your participation has been great. The panelists have been excellent, and I would like you to thank them with me. Uh, and finally, thank the uh, two organizers, the, the OSCE and uh, the OECD, sorry, and the Council of Europe. Uh, uh, we didn't have the opportunity to, to offer you the floor uh, here, but uh, as I said, I invite you to interact with the panelists uh, uh, now uh, that we have to come to the end of this, of this se session. Thank you very much. <laughs>